If you have your Bibles, I invite you to find the book of the Revelation, chapter 3. Find verse 7. You want to hold that there? I'm going to do a little bit of a history lesson. Shania said she just finished a history assignment. So maybe this will be right up your alley. If you test a little bit of your American history, you recognize the name William Penn. Anybody? William Penn. Good. Okay. And what do we know William Penn for? That's right. He was from Pennsylvania. No. <laughs> I did a little bit of reading about uh, William Penn, and yes, he is uh, basically the founder of of Pennsylvania, which was an existing province um, under the control of England. And uh, he was born in England in the 17th century, mid-1700s, or 1600s, I think, 1644-ish, something like that. There were kind of some defining points of his life, and it was really kind of fascinating to me. His dad, Admiral Sir William Penn, Sr., was an admiral in the Royal Navy, so he was at sea for much of William's growing up years. But William tells about, at the age of 12, that he had some sort of an encounter with God. His family was kind of, kind of a Puritan-type family, so there was kind of a mindfulness about God, but he had a very personal experience with God at 12 years old. And that experience actually intensified a little bit later on because his path would cross with one Thomas Lowe. Are you all familiar with this? So you're learning something. Good. Thomas Lowe. Now, Thomas Lowe was a traveling preacher. He was a Quaker. And uh, he had a particular passion and intensity about his faith. And that somewhere got lodged and embedded in William. Now, he knew that to take kind of the step as far as to, to move forward with this, the faith that he had found when he was 12 was probably going to be costly to him. You know why? Because Quakers were looked upon in England at that time as your religious radicals. They were seen as subversives and that it was officially and formally okay to persecute Quakers. And William found some of that because of his refusal, both in college and following, to engage in certain things that would violate his faith as a Quaker. That was one of the defining moments in his life. His own coming to faith and then to have that deeply embedded in him through the influence of Thomas Lowe. You got that? Follow me? Another episode, maybe anecdotal, but it's another episode in his life. This is when he's a young man out into making his way in the world. And he was there with a circle of friends, right? The Quakers, you refer to one another as friends. And they were there distri distributing tracts and leaflets downtown London. We're not exactly sure the circumstances, but somewhere nearby there was a tavern. And out of the tavern came a young naval officer in full dress who'd had a bit too much to drink and was brandishing his saber. And it created quite the spectacle, but... William and his friends saw this, but then they saw that for whatever reason, the young naval officer started making his way toward them, speaking loudly, incoherently, and waving his saber about. And everyone in the circle kind of froze, not really sure what to do. Part of Quakerism is pacifism, and so we're not really sure they were uncertain what to do and how to respond. But young William did not hesitate. He stepped to the young naval officer, effectively without doing any harm to himself or the young man, disarmed him. He then explained that his father was Sir, was Admiral Sir William Penn Sr. He informed the young man where he needed to go, and then in a dramatic move, William took the saber, snapped it over his knee, and sent the young man on his way showing not only a coolness of head of William, but also proving once again that the pen is mightier than the sword. <laughs> okay, I just threw that part in. But <laughs> uh, 
Okay, I made the whole thing up, but it's still a good story. And it got me to the joke that I wanted to get to. So, <laughs> the other defining, this is what's for real. The other <laughs> defining moment for William Penn was when he was in his 30s. And some of the, the details are kind of blurry, but apparently King Charles II owed a long-standing debt to William's father that had never really been settled up. So William Penn makes an appeal to see if he may lay claim to a province in the New World. King says, you know what? How about we do this? I'll grant that request, and we all call it even Stephen. And it's agreed, and that's understood to, to, to satisfy the debt, and William Penn lays claim to a province that would become Pennsylvania. Ironically, he couldn't get there right away, so he sent his cousin. And his idea, his idea in regard to this new place is that he wanted to create a place where people could practice their religion freely without fear of persecution. Now you see why that would be so important to him. Because he had embraced the Quaker faith and had experienced a lot of persecution because of it. And so when he was able to lay claim to this province that would be called Pennsylvania, he wanted it to be a place that people could exercise their religion freely without fear. Hmm. He also had in mind a city. He envisioned a city within that province that as he told his cousin, he said, I'd like it to be located someplace that's navigable, that's high and dry and wholesome. And he envisioned it to be a place marked by greenery so it wasn't just crowded in with buildings. So he says, use this, the space and create plots of greenery so that it won't simply grow on top of each other. And he had hopes that this city would embody something not only in terms of religious freedom, but just a spirit. And he had a name for that city already in mind. You all know what that is? Philadelphia. City of brotherly love. They boo Santa Claus there. <laughs> city of brotherly love. Penn's idea was commendable. But his idea for a name wasn't original. Did you know that? This is where those two things come together. His conversion at the age of 12 to Christian faith was about a generation after the King James Bible had been published for access and readability to the common man. No doubt, William Penn and family had a copy. So when it comes time for him to think of what kind of city, what, what kind of character would we create, he comes up with a name, but it's not original to him. It's actually from the Revelation chapter 3. There was a city in Asia Minor, which would be east side of the Mediterranean. And it was a city that had a small church in it. And it's a city that Jesus sends or speaks a message to the church in it. And it was actually created, the city of Philadelphia, by the younger brother who had a great regard for his older brother. And so while it had gone by another name, that became a presence within the city of, you know what, the great founder of the city had great regard for his older brother. And so it came to be known as Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Now, our purpose today isn't just to talk about the history of Philadelphia, but at least that launches us into something because we do want to take a look at this is the sixth of seven messages that Jesus speaks to churches. And this one is to Philadelphia. So if you have your scriptures, Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7. To the angel, messenger of the church in Philadelphia, write, the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds, 
Behold, I've put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have a little power, you've kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, say they are of the people of God, but they're not. They lie. Behold, I will make them to come, bow down at your feet, and to know I have loved you. Because you've kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. The hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have in order that no one takes your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it any more, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm going to leave that open, but let's say a quick prayer. And now, Father, I just pray that as you've spoken to this church in Philadelphia, that you would speak to this church here in Gordon and to me. Amen. I talked through a few weeks ago, but let me frame what we've got. There's seven messages that Jesus speaks to churches. Correct? What we have to understand is they're also in a certain structure. The first church, church number one and church number seven, carry strong caution. That would be the church at Ephesus and the church at Laodicea. The second church and the sixth church, these are churches that Jesus commends with no correction to them. That's Smyrna and Philadelphia. The three churches in between, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, are in crisis. And Jesus speaks to that. But we're now at number six. This is the little church in Philadelphia. And Jesus speaks to commend them with nothing to correct. We good so far? You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Jesus' message to Philadelphia has a little bit of twists and turns in it, but it still follows the same basic form. And that is he starts with introducing himself. Now, there is something very attention-getting about the church at Philadelphia. And that is when Jesus goes to introduce himself, every other church to this point... When Jesus introduces himself as far as kind of who he is or what he's like, it's like one or two. One or two references as far as who he is, what he's like. He's the one who holds the stars. He's the one who walks among the lampstands. He's the one who has the sword, um, uh, the word of God coming from his mouth. Those are things. But, but here in Philadelphia, there's four. He doubles up on who he is and what he's speaking to, these, these, uh, to the church here. And so let's just kind of line them up and knock them down, okay? Four things that he tells us about himself. You see it? Keep, keep it open and keep looking, okay? First of all, the Holy One. Now look, the more you know, the more you know. Jesus, in these messages to the seven churches... He keeps drawing from the Old Testament so that they know, you know what? What you're seeing in the Old Testament gets realized in me. And so when he talks about uh, Balaam, and he talks about, that's drawing from um, uh, Numbers. And then when he's talking about Jezebel, he's drawing from 1 Kings. And then when he talks uh, to Sardis, he's he's, uh, about uh, the seven spirits and all that, and he's, he's drawing from Zechariah and Ezekiel. And here, when he's talking about he's the Holy One, he's drawing from Isaiah. Listen, the Holy One is the signature description of God in Isaiah. God is described consistently as the Holy One, which means what? Anybody? When I hear holy, I usually think morally superior. Holier than thou, that sort of thing. That's not what holy means. Holy means different. God's different from us. God's is different from us as the artist is from the painting. He is as different from the creation as an artist from what they are creating. And Isaiah keeps attaching that to God, meaning God is not just a big man. God's different from us. He's different in the way he thinks. He's different in the way that he responds. He's different in terms of what he sees and what he thinks is important. He is different from us. And that's who God is. The Holy One. 
Do you see what happens here? Jesus introduces himself as the Holy One, meaning the God that Isaiah was talking about, that God that is different, that God who is, is entirely different in terms of the way he sees, thinks, responds, acts. That's me. The Holy One of Isaiah, Jesus says, that's me. I and the Father are of the same stuff. And then he says, not just that I'm the Holy One, what's the next one? Come on, audience participation. The Holy One, and then what? The true one. The true one. True runs on two tracks. There's the Roman idea of true, and then there's the Hebrew idea of true. Let me clarify that just a little bit. This church in Philadelphia has some Jews, people who used to be Jews, but they also have Gentiles. And the Gentiles, they know all about Roman world. And the Jews, they know all about the Old Testament. There's two different ideas about true. In the Roman idea, true means real. True means real. Not a phony. Not a fraud. Real. The real thing. The real deal. Do you see why that would be so important here? Philadelphia has all these gods running around. All these different pagan gods that people are worshiping. Some of them are idols and they carry them around. Then they bow down to them. Think how stupid that is. Your God's so powerless you have to carry him around and then you put him on a stand and then you worship him. What? That's no God. Romans would say, you know what? That's not a true God. It's not real. It's fake. It's phony. It's fraud. And here's Jesus coming, though, and he speaks to the church in Philadelphia with all these different gods that people carry around, and he says, I'm the true one. I'm the real God. And you can know it by this. I've been raised from the dead. The Jewish idea of true doesn't quite mean real. Did you know that? The Jewish idea of true means faithful. And we know that. We use that expression too, right? They were true to their word, meaning they were faithful. So in the Jewish mind, when they're hearing the one who is true, they're hearing there are all sorts of people that make all sorts of claims and they don't come through on the claims. There are all sorts of people who make all sorts of promises. And you know this. There are people who make all sorts of promises and they don't come, they don't come through on it. They're not true to their word. They're not true to their promise. They're not true to their presence. Jesus said, I'm the true one. Take it to the bank. If I've said it, you can trust it. If I said I'll be there, I'll be there. If I say that I will do it, I will do it. I will prove true. That is, he will be faithful. Okay, I'm going to move on. He says he has the key. We're okay on holy, right? We get that? The holy one and the true one. We're okay with that, right? If not, talk to me later. He says he has the key of David. That gets a little bit more uh, involved, but let's just, just frame it real simply. Look, who is the greatest king of Israel? Greatest king, David, right? Everyone says greatest king. He had his flaws, but he was the great king of the people of God in the world. And what, what Jesus is saying here when he says he has the key of David is, number one, David came to be not just the great king. He came to be seen as that image of who the real great king is. And Jesus says, I'm that. I'm the great king over the people of God. And he says, I have the key of David key of David. What does a key represent? Authority. Authority. In our family, there is a noticeable divide among the parents in regard to locking the car. One of us likes to lock the car. The other of us is gracious trusting, great-hearted toward humanity. I don't like to lock the car. <laughs> and one of the reasons I don't like to lock the car <laughs> is because I don't like being locked out of the car. Okay? <laughs> and when I'm locked out of the car, you know what that means? I don't have authority. So I have to go ask, can you let me in? <laughs> Because somehow, whenever the car gets locked, I don't get the key. And the key is the authority, right? 
And so here's Jesus and he's coming. He's saying, I have the key. I have the authority. I decide. This takes us to the fourth thing that he says. I decide who gets in and who doesn't. I hold the key and I open it and no one can shut it. And I shut it and no one can open it. He has the authority. And we look around. Now look. In Philadelphia, as near as we can tell what was going on is where he talks about those who say they're Jews, but they're not. What they were doing is they were pushing these Christians, they were pushing the believers out of the synagogue. They were, if you will, locking them out. And here's Jesus saying, I want to tell you who I am. I'm the one who holds the key. I'm the one who opens and nobody else shuts. I'm the one who shuts and nobody else opens. And those people who are pushing you out of the synagogue, let me tell you something. They have a key to the synagogue, but I have the key to the kingdom. I decide who's in. I decide who's out. And nobody changes my decision. One of the most thoroughly converted guys that I've ever met, his name's John McClarney. Great guy. Uh, a recovering alcoholic. He, I was talking with him uh, one time. This is back in Elkhart. And he says, hey, Barn." He said, I figured out a long time ago, religion isn't the way to go. He said, the reason I figured it out is I've been excommunicated from two different churches. <laughs> he said, but I know that I was on my knees in my bathroom, tired of puking, tired of the fact that I'd hurt so many people. And he said, and all I said was, God, you've got to help me. And he said, in that episode, God came to me while I'm on the bathroom floor and Jesus put his arms around me. He said, I figured out if I'm okay with Jesus, I'm okay. You know why? Jesus holds the key. Jesus holds the key. That's who he is. He moves from who he is to what he sees. And what Jesus sees is that they have a little power. What kind of power is that? Beats me. No, I shouldn't say that. I always heard, well, it's spiritual power which is great, and I wouldn't argue it. I just don't know what that is. Can you tell me what spiritual power means? We hear it. We say it a lot. But what is it? Well, they've got spiritual power. That's great. What is it? From Revelation chapter 3, here's what I understand spiritual power or a little power to be. First of all, don't get bogged down by little. They were just a little church. They were just a little gathering of believers. They weren't influencing policy but here's what power means. Integrity brings influence. And that's power. I wasn't saying it was fancy. I wasn't even saying it's complicated. Just remember this. Integrity brings influence. That's power. When I come and I say, this is who I am and what I'm about, and then I demonstrate that this is who I am and what I'm about, then I put myself in a place of influence. People don't have to agree with it. They don't have to like it. But they respect it. Integrity brings influence. That's power. Jesus says, you have a little power. You're showing integrity. And that's translating into influence. And then he goes on to say why. I hope you still have your Bibles open. He says you have a little power. This is a cause-effect relationship. Actually, it's an effect-cause relationship. The effect is they have a little power. And the cause is this. They've kept his word and they've not denied his name. Meaning, this is who we are. This is what we're about. And we're willing to stand for it. We're willing to show you. And that creates a little power. Kept the word and not denied the name. These are two sides of the same coin. And we go over it a little too fast. So I'm going to not go over it so fast because this is really important. Before I get into it, you all like me, don't you? When we talk about the idea of keep my word and do not deny my name, listen. Those are two ways, in the positive and then the negative, right? Kept my word and did not deny my name. So it's kind of like the quarter, two sides. But here's what that comes down to. That image is talking about, listen, that we bring our lives 
under his loving authority. Let it soak in for a minute. Kept my word means I brought my life under his loving authority. Did not deny my name. Asking in his name, not denying his name. Those are all words about authority, his authority. And the idea is this. You did not deny my authority in your life. Are you following me? I'll say it again. Keep my word and do not deny my name equals you bring your life under my loving authority. Do you see what that means then? Here's what it means. When Jesus calls us and instructs us that we are to forgive, now I have to decide if I will bring my life under that authority or will I not keep his word and deny his name. We gain power when we bring under his authority. Can I go on? Here we go. Jesus seems to think that gathering for worship and to encourage each other is a big deal. When we treat it as a big deal, we are keeping his word and not denying his name. When we don't treat it as a big deal, we're not keeping his word and we are denying his authority, his name in our lives. Make sense? Am I talking too light now? I'm going to keep going because there's more. Jesus says it's really, really important that you serve. That you serve to build one another up and thus build up the body. And when we refuse to serve, when we do not serve in any way, we are not keeping his word, we are denying his name, we are not bringing our lives under his authority, so therefore we lose power. Still following? I'm going to go from there to meddling. It's important for Jesus. He says you need to love one another. So when we decide we're not going to love one another, when we decide we'll talk bad, when we decide we'll take a bite out of somebody, you know what we're doing? We're not keeping his word, and we are denying his name. We're not bringing our lives under the authority, the loving authority of Jesus. I'll go on. Jesus says it's really, really important to give. It's really important not just to give, but to tithe. That's his instruction. That's his word. Do we keep it? If we do, we gain power. If we don't, we're denying his name. We're denying his authority in our lives. There's no other way to put it. You have a little power. Integrity brings influence. When there's integrity, and we brought our lives under the loving authority of Jesus, we have power because we're keeping his word and we have not denied his name. There, we made it through. That's what Jesus sees. You have a little power. You've not denied my name. You've kept my word. Last turn in this deal. It's what Jesus has to say about it. Jesus says about four things, and I'm going to say them real quick. Here they go. Ready? Number one. Jesus says, I have set before you an open door. Open door in the scriptures always means two things. It means welcome. I've opened the door that no one's going to shut. I'm welcoming you to the kingdom. And maybe other doors have shut in your face. This door is standing wide open. And it's also open to bring someone with you. That's the idea. Paul says that God set before them an open door, which simply means he opened a door for them to make a difference for Jesus in the lives of other people. And he opened that door for them to be able to minister, to bring a message, and to bring them to Christ. And Jesus is saying, I'm setting before you. Why? Because you have a little power. Your integrity has led to influence. You've kept my word. You don't deny my name. I'm setting before you an open door. Listen, when we don't live like that, doors close. When we do live like that, there may be those who don't like it. There may be those who disagree. But doors open. By the hand of Jesus, they open. That's what he says to them. I set before you an open door. Next. He says, I'm going to show those who are giving you a hard time, I'm going to show them that I love you. And that's Daryl Martin to me. Daryl Martin was my eighth grade teacher, and he was a math teacher, and he was a big guy. He seemed like he was a big guy, and kind of burly guy, and I was scared of him. And the other thing is, he was a new teacher, so you know what almost every new teacher does in their class? They have you sit in alphabetical order, which I hated. And I was there... And I'm in my spot, 
And I don't know if they still have them or not. You know those desks that kind of had the little desk over here and then they had the open slats in the back that you had to sit in the little compartment to put your books in? Anyone know what I'm talking about? You got it? Well, we're in those. And anybody who's ever endured this knows that what you want, if you have to sit in that kind of a chair, you want to sit in the back. You don't want to sit in front of anybody. And as it turned out alphabetically, put me in front of Mark Gamble. And Mark Gamble was the biggest pain in the rear end to most everybody. He wasn't really necessarily a bad guy, but he was what we would call a bad guy. <laughs> he was the instigator. You know what I'm talking about? The person that kind of pushes the button and then just waits to see what happens and then so forth. And so I'm sentenced <laughs> because of my name. I'm sentenced to sit in front of Mark Gamble. You know what that meant? Every day I was getting poked with a pistol between those slats. And every day I was getting my rear end kicked because he could do it and get away with it. And every day I realized the minute I turn around, I'm going to be in trouble because the teacher sees me turning around. Hey, Barney, turn around. It was my own personal purgatory. And one time, one fateful day, I'm there in my desk and Mark's behind me. And Mr. Martin, big Mr. Martin, is walking up to the front of the class and for some reason, Mark decides he's going to punch me in the back. I don't mean like a jab. I mean like this part of his civil boom. And you know what? He did. And I don't know if I just hadn't eaten anything today, but it sounded hollow. So you kind of have this thump. And then you heard me go involuntarily. Go, Ugh. <laughs> so you have thump. Ugh. And Mr. Martin turns around. And, and like by that time, it's like, I'm done. You know, I mean, Mark wasn't a big guy. And, but... Nonetheless, and I started to turn, and something about the right corner of my eye caught the corner of Mr. Martin's eye, and as I started to turn, Mr. Martin gave me the look like, you better not. And so I didn't turn, and then Mr. Martin steps up and he says, Mark, I have been patient with you, and Barney has been patient with you, and now it ends. And if you don't think so, try me. And there in front of me, and in front of Mark Gamble, and in front of that whole class, Mr. Martin showed them that he loved me. <laughs> Jesus is telling these people, the church in Philadelphia, that are being given a very difficult time. I'm not just going to set before you an open door. I'm going to show that I love you. Two more that he promises. He says, I will come and protect you. There are about four times in these messages that Jesus says, I'm going to come. Three of them aren't good. He tells uh, Ephesians, I'm going to take the lampstand away. He tells Pergamum, I'm coming with the sword of my mouth. He tells Sardis, I'm coming and it's over. Here he says, I'm coming to protect you. The last part, he says, I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple. I'm going to write new names on you, the name of my God, the name of the new city that comes down from heaven, and my new name. I don't know what all that means. I don't know anyone that really does. I just know this. Whenever we write our names on something, we're claiming ownership. It's mine. It belongs to me. And the deepest longing of our heart is to know that we truly are someone's. And Jesus says, you are. You are my special possession. And you never have to worry about it. That's the message to the little church that could church in Philadelphia.